you in association with Mobile One and Champion Spark Plugs. You can't beat a champion. Nigel Mansell wins his 17th Grand Prix, the most ever by an English driver. The stories behind the 1991 French Grand Prix coming up on Inside Track. At the conclusion of the Mexican Grand Prix, the Formula One teams returned to Europe. Thirteen of the teams went directly to the Silverstone circuit in England for tyre tests. But intermittent rain over the scheduled three days hampered the testing. For McLaren, this meant a missed opportunity to make improvements to their chassis. Ferrari's new 643 chassis wasn't ready and made its debut a few days later in Italy. And Nigel Mansell used the time to further accustom himself to the new layout of his home circuit. Martin Donnelly used the occasion to visit some old friends, the first time he'd been to a Formula One circuit since his accident at Hereth last year. When you come to a test day, it's, it's more relaxed, the teams are more relaxed, and uh, you can spend more time talking to the drivers and with the teams. He's still keeping in contact with Eddie Jordan, we understand. Um, he's been keeping you informed? Oh, you have to. I mean, he's, uh, he's my manager. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I obviously know all the mechanics and the engineers there over the years. They've, they felt maybe we've been good for one another. And uh, I keep in touch with a lot of teams, with uh, Team Lotus, with Eddie Jordan, with McLaren, with everybody. Uh, you, don't, you, you can't afford to cut yourself off. The 27-year-old native of Northern Ireland showed outstanding promise in Formula 3000, winning the European Championship for Eddie Jordan Racing in 1989. The following year, he was signed to drive for the Lotus Lamborghini team in Formula One, and he's seemed destined for greater things. But in qualifying for the Spanish Grand Prix, Donnelly crashed at 150 miles per hour, suffering massive leg injuries. And although his racing career now seems in jeopardy, Donnelly remains optimistic about his chances of driving again. Martin, a lot of people are asking um, about your prognosis and um, when they can see you back in a car. What can you tell them? Well, I mean, you're almost asking the impossible there. Only time will do the, do the job. But I would like to think at this stage, sometime September. After Silverstone, the teams packed up and headed for France and the new venue for the French Grand Prix, the Circuit Nevers Manicure. For the past six years, the French stop on the Formula One calendar has been Le Castellet on the Côte d'Azur. But with the completion of the new Manicure circuit, the sun and sand of the south was replaced by the lush green pastures and magnificent chateau of rural France. Some of the towns in this region of central France date back to the 14th century, a distinct contrast to the ultra-modern Manicure motor racing facility. The spacious pit, paddock and garage complex can accommodate Formula One personnel and their equipment with room to spare. Journalists and the television and radio personnel who cover the race have been provided with modern facilities in order to maximize the efficiency of filing reports. As for the circuit itself, Every effort was made to consult the drivers on ways of making it technically demanding on cars and drivers without jeopardizing safety. Still, a few problems have to be ironed out, most notably the lack of places to overtake. 
when we decide to do it, we have a very small place. And after, we, buy, we can buy everything around. But normally, when we start to do the design of the track, we must keep it the whole track, and it was a little bit difficult. But now, I think it's a good track. We will be some change for next year, at the end of the stretch, like the driver asked. But I think it's a very difficult track, very technical, uh, very hard for the physically. No, it will be a very nice Grand Prix. Several major changes within the teams took place between Mexico and Manicur, including a new sponsorship deal for the financially troubled La Russe team. The sports car manufacturer, Venturi, signed a lucrative deal that would initially cover just the French Grand Prix, but with an option for the rest of the season. It was hoped that a long-term deal would cure La Russe's financial problems. AGS, too, was sporting a new livery, all in line with a new ownership scheme to keep the team's profile high as it fights to avoid pre-qualifying. Footwork took a step backwards as it withdrew its troublesome Porsche V12 engine in order to develop it further. The team now reverts to Cosworth power in the latest chassis, although the adaptation proved tricky. Porsche had had problems with the oil system, power and weight of its V12, and team principal Jackie Oliver felt it better to stop the public testing of the engine in races until the problems were solved. And Ferrari unveiled its radically new 643, completely different from the cockpit forward with aerodynamic changes that include a nose section not unlike the Williams, with its rounded top and sharply sloped front section. The radiators are differently configured, which required a reshaping of the air intakes. It adds up to what the drivers feel is a far superior chassis to the one they started the season with. Uh, you know, people say the um, uh, Ferrari are sleeping and, um, you know, it was not true. Just uh, they work uh, very hard in the factory and um, now they, they give to the drivers two, uh, two new cars. So uh, Ferrari uh, uh, work a lot and uh, I think now... Uh, Everybody is a little bit um, um, uh, happy to, to see uh, the, the car more competitive. France has produced many top drivers in all types of motor racing ever since someone decided that cars weren't just for getting from A to B. Many of the country's top drivers received their training here at the Renault Elf Drivers School. Drivers are taught everything from physical use of the pedals to the theory of centrifugal force and kinetics. The ultimate test isn't a written exam, but a practical one. Pupils have to prove themselves superior to the others in front of a jury of great drivers, both past and present. The job is to convince the jury that you're fast, consistent and made of the right stuff. Three-time world champion Alain Prost was a graduate of this school. No surprise that he was voted top of the class. From there, drivers graduate one step up the ladder to the Formula Renault series. Then it's the French Formula 3 championship. The competition gets tougher, the skill behind the wheel that much sharper. The next step is Formula 3000. Eric Comas won this championship last year, earning himself a drive with Ligier in Formula 1 this season. Other graduates of the Renault Elf School, now in Formula 1, are Olivier Grouillard, Eric Bernard, Jean Alesi, and of course, Alain Prost. It was 10 years ago that Prost took his first Grand Prix victory winning the 1981 French Grand Prix at Dijon. The weather was anything but ideal that day. Nevertheless, Prost managed to stay ahead of John Watson and Nelson Piquet to take the chequered flag and a place on the rostrum in front of his home crowd. In 1982, the race was switched to Le Castellet in the south of France, where Renault was to win again. However, it was René Arnoux who upset Prost by taking victory the Tierce completed by Didier Peroni. The following year, the Renaults of Prost and Arnoux were 1-2 on the grid, but Arnoux had mechanical problems, and Prost cruised to victory the sixth of his career. Back at Dijon again in 1984, the local fans were hoping to see another victory by a French driver. 
Alain Prost had gone to McLaren and his place at Renault was taken by Patrick Talmbay. But in the end, Nicky Lauda would triumph, relegating Tambay to second place with Nigel Mansell finishing third. In 1985, it was back to Le Castellet, where Nelson Piquet and Brabham gave Pirelli their first Grand Prix win since 1957, almost 28 years. And as Piquet showed on the rostrum, he wanted everyone to know about it. For the next two years, the French Grand Prix was won by Nigel Mansell in a Williams. In 1986, he finished ahead of Prost and Piquet. While the following year, the same two drivers joined Mansell on the podium, this time PK second and Prost third. And for the next three years, the French Grand Prix became the property of Alain Prost. The 1989 race was particularly eventful, with Mauricio Guzelman flipping at the first corner. The race restarted with Nigel Mansell's Ferrari in the pit lane and Prost scored his fourth win of the decade, emphasising his mastery of his home Grand Prix. Prost had switched from McLaren to Ferrari for 1990 but still managed to maintain his incredible success record for the 42nd win in his career. But equally impressive was Ivan Capelli's second place in the Leighton House Judd. It was an incredible result, considering the team's early season form. This year, the cars are powered by Ilmore's new V10 engine. Nevertheless, last year's French success was in the back of everyone's mind, especially Capelli's. We are hoping to do the same. Is the circuit is different? but uh, the conditions are more or less the same with a very flat circuit and surface because the, uh, the, the circuit is new. We have the car with a new, something new at the front, so we're expecting to improve the, our performance in the car. And uh, we are in France, so uh, we're, we are hoping to, to do a similar race, uh, not maybe with the same result, but to be actually in a position to score some points. Although there are many factors that can make the difference between scoring points and going home empty-handed, one of the key variables is fuel. But what's the difference between the fuel in Formula One cars and the fuel that goes into a normal road car? The primary difference is probably the fuel that we use for Formula One is very highly tailored to meet the requirements of the F1 engines. Uh, the fuel that you get in the road car has to be really to some extent compromise because it fits a whole range of different vehicle types, uh, different vehicle technologies. And the, the analogy that one could draw out here is probably between a, a fine malt, single malt whiskey and an ordinary blend whiskey. Both are very good products, but the malt is perhaps a slightly more polished of the two. The one factor about racing fuel that is most immediately apparent, however, is the smell. Its unique aroma is ever-present, lingering, and somewhat hard to describe. The, the smell of fuel is an interesting one because it is something which has attracted a lot of attention this season. Basically, if I can return to the earlier point about the road car, um, a commercial gasoline, you have to be able to start your car, for example, at 7 o'clock in the morning, minus 5 degrees. Um, and therefore, you have to have volatile components in there which allow you to get this cold starting performance. That type of performance isn't necessary for these cars. We know very closely what is happening when they're going to be used. And so some of the lighter components can be taken out. And it is these that give gasoline its characteristic smell. And what we're doing is removing the parts that you would normally smell, which allows some of the heavier components, which you may not normally get the, the benefit of, and you can actually smell them in Formula One gasoline. The process of making fuel initially starts in research centres where scientists construct computer models based on how a fuel will burn and perform. A test blend is then concocted and physically tested for octane numbers and density. Once the blend has passed through that stage, it is supplied to the engine manufacturer, whose telemetry allows the fuel manufacturer to improve the computer modelling of their product. Some companies have used as many as 50 fuels already this season. It's a long and expensive process, pushing the price of racing fuel well beyond the average cost at the fuel station. 
In this day and age of concern for the environment, unleaded fuels have now made an inroad in Formula One. This season we've come out very strongly. McLaren have backed us fully in this, that we will only use unleaded fuels in Formula One. Beyond that, of course, we have a responsibility both to the people working with the fuel here in the pits and our own people who blend the fuel. So we do do rigorous safety checks on everything that is used in the fuel and we are happy that the fuel is, is safe and as environmentally friendly as it can be. First to experience the Manicure circuit on this Grand Prix weekend on an ever hotter Friday morning with the eight pre-qualifiers. In the hour-long session, Andrea de Cesaris took his Jordan Ford round quickest to head the four pre-qualifiers that would go through into official qualifying. JJ Lechto suffered overheating due to a jammed valve, but once he changed to the spare Delara Judd, he was able to set second quickest time and maintain his 100% success record in pre-qualifying. After an extensive test at Silverstone, Olivier Grillard was able to pre-qualify for the second race running in the British-developed Fomet Ford, setting third fastest time. Emanuele Pirro was fourth until his battery exploded and he was stuck out on the circuit. Bertrand Gascher was then fortunate to pip Pirro for fourth spot, for the Jordan driver had also struck bad luck during the session. Yeah, I had a fuel pressure problem when I came out with my second set of qualifiers. First set I got blocked, second set fuel pressure, no, no fuel. So I said, ah, oh, what am I going to do? So I just went full and tried to forget about the problem. So I'm really happy. I didn't think I made it. It meant poor Pirro had missed out for the third time this year. But the end is in sight thanks to Leto's third place at Imola. The same applies to Eric van der Poel, who crashed heavily at the end of pre-qualifying, thankfully without injury. Crowds had begun to gather on Friday for the weekend's first qualifying session, held in temperatures approaching 90 degrees, easily the hottest of the year. The day's sessions had been delayed. Firstly, there was this hare, which was excluded for not obeying Marshall's instructions, failing to stop for a weigh-in and overtaking a tortoise in a dangerous manner. Its destiny was not revealed. Furthermore, glass from the start-finish lights shattered due to engine noise and covered the track with broken glass, while unfed doctors went on strike and further delayed proceedings. The man to beat when qualifying eventually got underway was Riccardo Patrese, on pole for the previous two races. Agari Suzuki tested the limits of adhesion when trying for an extra lap on qualifiers, but recovered to take out the spare car for another run. He held up Olivier Guillard, who later had his own moment, demolishing the bollards at the pit lane entrance. Setting seventh fastest time was Thierry Bootsen in the locally based Ligier Lamborghini, running new Frank Derny designed bodywork for the first time in qualifying. Just ahead of him was Gerhard Berger's McLaren Honda, the Austrian still not happy with his car's handling and held up by traffic, a common complaint at Manicur. Only fifth was Riccardo Patrese, plagued by a constant misfire caused by the pneumatic valve system in his Renault engine. Fourth was Alain Prost, already encouraged by the improved handling of the new Ferrari, but admitting that there was still more development to be done before he could go for pole. Teammate Jean Alesi was just ahead of him, and equally encouraged. In spite of almost constant testing, it was obvious that the team still had to learn about their new car. Nigel Mansell was second quickest and greatly encouraged. He'd made mistakes at two corners, so second on the provisional grid boded well for future things if the track was quicker on Saturday. But one man proved that his competitors should never discount him. Williams and Prost at Ferrari have had just one target so far this year, Ayrton Senna. And whatever the troubles his team and engine manufacturer may have had with their products, the man himself proved that on his day he can still blitz them all half a second quicker than the rest of the field on this day. Prost and Ferrari's new engineering director, Claudio Lombardi, know that they at least have their quarry in sight. And Mansell was heartened to have beaten his teammate, admitting that it was difficult to overtake on this circuit. 
Yeah, I think so very much. Um, I think it's as hard to overtake here as it is in Monte Carlo. And at the moment, Ayrton and I are on the front row, and tomorrow I think we'll both have to go quicker to stay there because Ferrari is very quick. I think the new car is working good. And <laughs> I just feel that uh, the track should be a little bit quicker tomorrow. But we've had a few problems today, so I'm reasonably optimistic that we can hopefully start at the front. The fundamental thing for the race result here is going to be reliability and equilibrium in the car for having a good performance during the race and uh, not so high tire wear and therefore a good average. On Friday, a very special dinner was hosted by Longines and Olivetti to celebrate their 150th Grand Prix. Olivetti Longines are responsible for the timing, collection and processing of associated data at all Grand Prix, as well as the computer graphics one sees on one's television set at home. Here's how it works. Inside the nose of every car is a small transmitter. In effect, it acts as an electronic watchdog to keep an accurate record of where the car is on the track, its speed and its relationship to where it is placed among all the other cars. As the cars flash across the start finishing line, a receiver picks up the radio signal from the transponder in the car and this is fed by cable to the main computer room. Fans on circuit get this information via timers above the start finishing line whereas teams on the pit wall see it on their Olivetti monitors. People at home receive this information on their television screens. Once the information is finalized, Olivetti makes it available to the teams and international press from their own control center. In spite of Brazilian encouragement on Saturday, cooler weather suggested that everyone would be quicker today, so could Senna hang on to his provisional pole position? Mansell was the first to prove that times would tumble, and the Englishman would later set a time that would eventually be just 0.4 seconds slower than pole position. Yet so close and competitive were the times that he would start only fourth on the grid. Alessi improved to second for the moment, but would eventually start sixth after a somewhat over-enthusiastic run saw him thump a couple of curves in the still new Ferrari. Senna, however, nearly confirmed his Friday form. In spite of an engine failure in the morning, he went quickest overall on his first run on qualifiers, but no one was in any doubt that the second run, if a clear lap, would be vital. Prost knew that pole position was imperative on a circuit where overtaking was so difficult and he went even quicker than Senna, but still under no illusions that the new Ferrari was in need of development. Alain Prost, after such a short time with the new car, today's result is quite spectacular, don't you think? It's very spectacular, especially because uh, uh, the team brought a new, a new car here, the French Grand Prix difficult for everybody for me because a lot of pressure this this track and uh, to bring a new car like this and uh, having no problems at all during the weekend it's a big uh, it's a big show from the from the team uh, I mean, they, they work very well and the mechanics were very hard in uh, in a few days and uh, it's quite spectacular not to have any prob big problems and the uh, reliability and performance was better and better through the weekend so it's good but after his problems the previous day, plus three laps in traffic, Riccardo Patrese posted his third consecutive pole position on his first clear qualifying lap, 26 minutes before the end of the session. It was 2.9 seconds quicker than his time the previous day. So why so much quicker? Mainly the temperature was a little bit, a little bit cooler, and I think also the track became a bit quicker, maybe rubber down. So the track became a bit quicker because of that, and especially the temper, because yesterday was much hotter. Pole position is very, very important, so sitting in the front row on pole tomorrow is going to be very, very good. I think so, yes. This, this is a pole position that really counts more than maybe Mexico, because there you can have a place where you can overtake here is much more difficult, so I hope to have a nice start. Any further chances of improvement weren't exactly enhanced by Olivier Guillard who, thanks to a loose oil cooler pipe, sprayed oil onto the track for a solid three laps. There was no loss of power, so Olivier just kept going. One man who tried to improve on his time, typically late in the session, was Ayrton Senna, and he succeeded by just two thousandths of a second, but the oil caught him as he finished the lap, 
and he reversed lightly into the wall. A little bit away on the circuit that was dropped by a car that was just uh, one minute before me on the circuit and then the, the, the track was slippery. During the lap I lost the car a little bit in a corner because it was slippery and but finishing the lap it was really slippery here at the chicane and I just lost the car putting the power down but crossed the finish line instead of facing forward 90 degrees so I had a little bit of fun but it was no danger because it's very slow that that part of the circuit and wide so it was safe <laughs> One of the more prominent and long-standing of race car manufacturers in the world today is Lola. And a few weeks ago, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, John Major, was on hand to officially open Lola's new headquarters in Huntingdon, England. It's not surprising, given the status and amount of corporate sponsorship involved in motor racing, to see heads of state take an active interest in how the sport progresses. Now, because we're not in the technical centre, I have nothing to unveil in this uh, high-tech industry. And being a natural romantic, so I must say, to start a business with a couple of people in this high-tech, high-expense industry, you have to be a couple of romantics. Uh, they decided, well, what can we do if we are not able to unveil a plan? And naturally, being romantic, there was only one thing they could do. And so, they produced... <laughs> this magnificent bottle of champagne which I was hoping to open and I won't tell you where I was going to direct it <laughs> but it has already been opened so I'm going to give it a good shake and then dump <laughs> right right and then I shall know <laughs> well it is tempting <laughs> It is tempting, but I won't do it. Uh, but I will try and aim at, uh, at the car. So I will step back. I will step back just, just a little. <coughs> Shall we ask the district council about their expenditure? Right. And at Manicure on the Sunday of the French Grand Prix, President François Mitterrand was the guest of the organizers and promoters of the race. They proudly displayed the circuit and its facilities to the man who had made it all possible. President Mitterrand, along with the 150,000 fans scattered along the circuit, were also treated to an aerial display by some of France's best pilots. And now here's Roberta Moreno to take us through a lap of the new Manicure circuit. I'm going at the moment very slow to save the tyres um, for my flying lap. I will start to go quick just uh, after the chicane before the pits where the lap time starts. Uh, we're just approaching the chicane now so I'm preparing myself. And uh, now I'm, I'm going to go in second gear and go flat out. Go through the gears in second, third, fourth fifth and the next corner is flat out in fifth and then there's a, a quick break down to fourth a very difficult corner with a lot of g-force here and they have to play with the throttle because the car is under steering a little bit into fifth six that's the down straight way the only place maybe you can pass here during the race then you have a very hard break into first gear here this is the hardest point for braking this is the overtaking point into second another chicane and then in the middle of the chicane, we're going to third, throw the, in through the curbs to go quicker, down to fifth, now a quick fourth gear chicane, very, very, a lot of G-force here, into fifth, back down to second, a very uh, low, uh, long corner in second gear, up through the gears, all the way to fifth, and another very quick chicane that you can't see in fourth gear, and back on the power, and try very hard, a hard braking for second gear now, and uh, very slippery here and uh, third, fourth, fifth down to the chicane before the pitching third, throw the car through back on the power, back down to second 
and we just finished the lap here that was a quick one so the cars on the grid ready for the 72 lap french grand prix with ricardo patrese on pole position for the third race running alain prost alongside him ayrton senna on row two with nigel mansell gerhardt berger on row three with jean alesi and then the two benettons of nelson piquet and roberto moreno Mauricio Guzelmin on row five with Gianni Morbidelli going well. Stefano Modena on row six with Pierluigi Martini. Andrea De Cesaris on row seven with Eric Comas. Ivan Capelli with Thierry Bootsen having dropped back on row eight. Mark Blundell and Satoru Nakajima row nine. Bertrand Gachot and Johnny Herbert row ten. Olivier Gruyard and Agari Suzuki row eleven. Row 12, Eric Bernard and Martin Brundle. And row 13, Michele Alvaretto and JJ Lechto. Those were the 26 cars that started the French Grand Prix. Riding on board with Riccardo Patrese. The green flag at the back to tell them that the lights can go on. And when they turned to green, Riccardo Patrese made a good start. But when he went for second gear, he found nobody home and was literally swallowed up by the pack as they swarmed past him. Off onto the grass and dust went Ivan Capelli, but he was able to rejoin. However, Bertrand Gachot was left irretrievably in the dirt and his race was over before it had begun. Alain Prost then, out in the lead from Nigel Mansell. Ayrton Senna in third place, then Gerhard Berger and Jean Alesi, while Nelson Piquet went ahead of teammate Roberto Moreno. The two Benetton Fords following up the Williams of Mansell, the two Ferraris and the two McLarens. A good shot of Moreno following closely behind Nelson Piquet on this opening lap. Behind Moreno is Gianni Morbidelli. But in these opening stages, Prost and Mansell eased away from the two McLarens of Senna and Berger who had a Lacey in tow. Then came another gap to Piquet, Moreno, Morbidelli and Patrese. Gradually, the leading pair pulled away from the McLarens, with Mansell shadowing Prost all the way. Tire stops were expected, so it was very much a waiting game for the Williams driver. Prost and Mansell then dominating this French Grand Prix, but out on him, and we'll be able to see. Now there is Moreno, behind him is Martini, then there, that is Suzuki, who is about to be caught by Alain Prost. And what a line of traffic, and in the background, behind the Jordan Ford, you saw Nigel Mansell, who is now three and a half seconds behind Alain Prost, the race leader, coming up behind the Lola now. Yes, and I back Mansell to be much more effective in this sort of heavy traffic than Alain Prost. He's more forceful and uh, he's more prepared to take his car offline and attack. As we see him going in the background there, he saw Mansell ducking out. And it looked to me as though Aguri Suzuki in the La Rousse Lola was dropping out of the race. That's Martini who has got... Alain Prost tucked up behind him and Pierre Luigi Martini is in ninth position. So Prost now has lapped everybody up to eighth position and in that eighth place is Roberto Moreno in the Benetton Ford. Now, you should see the yellow car. There it is. Now, there is Prost. He's catching Roberto Moreno who is in eighth position. In front of Moreno is Mauricio Guggelman in the Leighton House seventh. PK is sixth. Patrese is in fifth place, seventh and seven seconds behind Jean Alesi in fourth place. Senna still third, 24 seconds behind Mansell, who is three and a half seconds behind Prost, completing his 34th lap now. Yes, and I have to say that uh, the tyre change and Mansell in the traffic has uh, pulled up about a second on Prost, just under two and a half seconds. The gap. But of course, it's not really about the time gap on the circuit at the moment, it's about the traffic that they're amongst and who can emerge best. And the, the, the time gap will only matter when they're both out of it, as Prost sneaks through 
And Prost now has the clear circuit. And that was Moreno who let him go. Quite rightly. And Mansell. And now Mansell has to start worrying because he has got one, two, three, something like three, four cars to pass before he can start chasing Alain Prost. And Prost has a clear bit of track ahead of him. Mansell's really made up ground. Just got a glimpse of him in the background there. And, uh, <laughs> somebody's hit the wall very hard indeed. For somebody being Mark Blundell, who joins his teammate Martin Brundle, both the Brabham's out, and that's very, very bad news for Brabham. They desperately needed at least a seventh place here in France or Silverstone at the British Grand Prix next weekend to avoid the dreaded pre-qualification. Well, they're clearly not going to get that seventh place at the moment. And now Alain Prost closes on Thierry Boutsen, the Frenchman in the Ligier Lamborghini, who is in 17th position to lap the Belgian driver Thierry Boutsen. He's already been lapped twice, so this will be the third time that the Ferrari's gone past him. And Mansell, meanwhile, is right up with the V12 in front of him now. V10 Renault chases V12 Ferrari, the Renault in the Williams chassis, and the Ferrari in a chassis of the same make. Nigel Mansell, who so very nearly, so very, very nearly won the Canadian Grand Prix, getting down to the last corner before rolling into retirement. Having finished in second place in Monaco and Mexico, he's bidding for victory in France. Boots in his lap for the third time by Prost, now by Nigel Mansell. And still, Ayrton Senna is soldiering on no other way to describe it looking for those four points for third position ahead of jean alacy who can do nothing about the mclaren in front of him you're looking at the ferrari now of alain prost from the cockpit of nigel mansell's williams renault and here we have oh dear that's a very seriously deflated well punctured rear of jj leto the finnish driver to put, it's a bad race meeting for the Delara team because Emanuele Pirro failed to pre-qualify. I get the impression that uh, with the rubber going down, that the circuit is starting to return now in its conditions to yesterday's form because we've got uh, now Senna and Alesi are starting to make uh, progress in terms of their lap times. They're now lapping nearly as quickly as Prost and Mansell out front, and in the early part of the race, they were quite unable to do that. Uh, Patrese, conversely, is making no progress, really, in fifth place, and has been, in fact, losing ground to Senna and Alesi. And Alain Prost has just lapped Eric Comas there in the Blue Ligier with its V12 Lamborghini engine. Comas is in 13th position. a wave and not a very happy way to come out as he goes past him and Alain Prost goes past Stefano Modena in the Tyrrell who is in 12th position and Nigel Mansell's got to catch the Italian and get past him as Prost comes up to complete very shortly his 48th lap out of 72. Looking now at Modena's Tyrrell Honda with a V10 engine unlike the V12 of Ayrton Senna and Gerhard Berger, who started this race, but was the first to retire on lap eight. And now this is Nigel Mansell going past, and he does it at the Imola Benz. Well, this is the end of lap 48. And here is Alain Prost. That was 1.2 seconds. Prost goes through and completes the lap. And the gap has increased to 2.2 seconds. See, Pross was able to make better use of the traffic, and you can see now that he's pulled out quite a, quite a cushion over Nigel Mansell. And I've just seen the fond metal go past smoking badly and possibly putting a, a, an oil stick down on the circuit. Well, if he is, Griot will not...
not be at all popular because this is exactly what happened when an oil union worked loose in practice yesterday and Griard drove round for three laps consistently spraying oil over the circuit to the detriment of a lot of drivers and Mika Hakkinen failed probably to qualify in the Lotus by about three one hundredths of a second because of that and Ayrton Senna actually spun on Griard's oil. There is Griard and there is the smoke from the back yes and it doesn't appear it appears to be only being spread about in smoke form at the moment obviously going onto the exhaust pipe but uh, if it becomes more of a gusher some of that will get onto the track in, in liquid slippery form and as you see Nigel Mansell is now the fastest man on the circuit one minute 19.168 to close within one and a half seconds of Prost as Griard draws up underneath my commentary position and I'm looking down on the mechanics who have been spraying fire extinguisher fluid on the rear of the car. Griard is getting out to retire. So the Frenchman's race is run. One world championship point in his career when he finished sixth in the French Grand Prix for the Ligier team. But look at this. What a charge by Nigel Mansell. Lap 50. Uh, Ayrton Senna coming up to the Benetton Ford of Nelson Piquet who is in sixth position long since lapped of course by Prost Mansell and now he's going to be lapped by the third position man Ayrton Senna so the race is getting pretty spread out and we've just heard from the pits that uh, Patrese has gearbox problems so that explains Patrese's relative uh, disappointment in this race uh, from pole position. He looked set to uh, dominate possibly and certainly to be right up battling for the lead. But uh, the automatic gear, the semi-automatic gearbox on the Williams still causing them grief. And uh, if anything becomes, becomes between the Williams team and the World Championship this year, it will without any doubt be their semi-automatic gearbox and the early use of it before it was fully developed. right with Alain Prost and you can see for yourself how close they are as they come through to complete lap 54 and you can see one, two, three, four cars ahead of them that they will shortly catch and this could be Nigel Mansell's golden opportunity to get past Alain Prost if the Frenchman fumbles the traffic. And look at the way the Williams is starting to close. Yes, and this is fine driving by Mansell. He can see the cars in front, and he's getting himself into position and uh, making Prost, I'm sure, feel very uncomfortable. And Mansell's trying to get around the outside. He's got a oh, he's got him, got in front of Prost around the outside. Now that is something else, something else, sensational stuff from Mansell. The outbreak, Alan Prost round the outside and just put yourself across his bars. Is great skill. It's also pretty brave. Here's a replay. There's Alain Prost. Mansell drives right up alongside him, gets half a car's length, moves across. Prost is forced back. That's absolutely legitimate. And Nigel Mansell takes the lead as he had done before. And you can see now he's behind his ailing teammate, Ricardo Patrese, as Prost goes through and takes Roberto Moreno, who is in his position. Yes, and I think that manoeuvre rather got to Prost. I detected a little bit of anger then, the way he was going following Nigel past the back markers. He looked pretty angry into the hairpin. And uh, so he should be embarrassed. He uh, went to the inside to protect the corner. And Mansell saw the opportunity and just went straight to the outside, gave himself a much faster line to the corners. Prost tries again. Yeah, and Patrese, I suspect, is helping Nigel Mansell there. He's let Mansell through. He can see Prost behind him. He knows he's got no chance in this race, which at the present moment, on lap 56, is led by Nigel Mansell. There is Prost in second position. Senna is 35 seconds behind in third place, ahead of Alessi, who is fourth. Ricardo Patrese, fifth, and Nelson Piquet in sixth position, one lap down. Into the pits comes Stefano Modena in his Tyrrell Honda to change of tyres. And the body language of that arrival was uh, a bit more fundamental than tyres. 
came in a bit slowly, but it looks to me like, well, he's going out again, but it didn't look like a very committed hurry to me. So there is Mansell. And he's got a little bit of space. Back to Alain Prost. Courtesy of the traffic and uh, his charging driving. There's the caption, 14 laps to go. And Mansell now has a four-second lead. And now Piquet coming into the pits. Is this uh, yet more tyres, more Ferraris? And it does seem to have been uh, not their day. Whoops, oh, nearly dropped the revs. Nearly stalled it. We're riding with the lead, Williams, now as Mansell skirts the right-hander, hugging the edge. Now, this is the drop downhill underneath the bridge into the chicane. Right, left, hard on the brakes for the Lise, which is the hairpin right to complete the lap. Accelerating away past the pits up into fifth gear, 140 miles an hour into the left-hander, which leads into the fourth gear right-handed Grand Fourbe. As Prost goes through, 5.5 seconds behind Mansell, having lapped marginally faster on his 62nd lap than the Williams. It'll be interesting to see whether Prost is trying to pull something out of the bag in the closing stages of the race to try for his sixth victory in France. Yes, I think uh, he's going to struggle. Mansell seems to just have the edge on this. Seems to be controlling the race and looking pretty happy. And Andrea de Cesaris in the Jordan Ford moves up into sixth position. Eddie Jordan's team, brand new, which has done so brilliantly well in racing this year, is back in the points. Fingers crossed, everybody, who is a Nigel Mansell or a Williams Renault fan. Because remember what happened to Nigel Mansell in Canada when with victory securely in his grasp, up to the last corner he securely went, only to roll to a frustrated and frenzied standstill and lose first place and finish sixth. And as Moreno, Roberto Moreno, he's been going slower and slower. Not a good day for the Benettons. That's a retirement. then leads and we're waiting for Alain Prost it's 6.9 seconds and Mansell is pulling away and I wonder what the atmosphere in the Williams pit is well Jonathan Palmer is there and he can tell us well of course they've been in this situation only a few races ago at Montreal and there's no complacency whatsoever about the Williams pit now they've still got four tires out in their blankets just in case there should be a drama all the mechanics still standing by, people looking pretty apprehensive, obviously with fingers crossed this time. Well, we can keep them firmly crossed, but things are looking good for Nigel Mansell. So those lumps on the road are bits of rubber that have come off the tyres. That is Frank Williams himself looking impassive, as he did in Canada when Nigel Mansell was almost home and dry for victory, the first of 1991 for the Englishman. And if Nigel Mansell wins, I should think this is going to put another trivial £50,000 on the Silverstone gate for the British Grand Prix next weekend, because Silverstone is Nigel Mansell's circuit. He's always got a tremendous backing from the British crowd, which is worth about a second a lap to him, slight exaggeration, but Mansell will be on a terrific high if he wins here and goes to Silverstone next weekend almost certainly in second position in the World Championship, albeit some 25 points behind Ayrton Senna, if the Brazilian finishes in the third place that he is holding now, and this is lap 70, just this, lap 71 and lap 72 to go, with Mansell now nearly seven seconds ahead of Alain Prost, Senna is 38 seconds behind Prost, two seconds ahead of Alessi who is fourth, Patrese is a lap down in fifth place, the Cesare is still sixth in the Jordan. Keep seeing Mansell's appear to have a problem two corners ago around that uh, slow hairpin. The car seems to stutter, but it gets going again. And it doesn't seem to be a serious problem. And the other thing is that Prost uh, seems to have uh, given up the chase, settled for second place, when uh, he had Piquet between them 
he didn't really make a big effort to get past PK or to hurry. He's now past him, but uh, he looks like he's just going to follow Mats around and uh, pick up his six points for second place. Well, meantime, behind the first two, Mansell and Prost, things are getting closer as Nigel Mansell... Well, well, he tries to pass Gujamin, who backs off. Now, Jean Alisi, he's charging in the Ferrari. And if he has a stab at Senna, I'm not too sure that Senna won't say, well, I don't want to lose uh, even fourth place, so I might just let him go. And I think a really aggressive um, showing of the nose by Alesi might just get Senna to capitulate and hand over third place to him. And Mansell now is on his last lap. So, Mansell, looking good now. He was being super cautious then with Gujelman. Gujelman made room, he backed off, he took it easy. And really a tremendous race from Mansell. He showed us his tremendous skills in overtaking. Twice got up and past Prost, both times in quite brilliant fashion. And uh, this win has been long awaited. He's really deserved it and it makes him the highest Grand Prix winning Englishman of all time. If he can just make it to the line. Nigel Mansell and really well deserved if he can do it. Nigel Mansell on his way, almost there, as he was in Canada, but this time I'm sure he's going to finish. And it will be to win his 17th Grand Prix of his career and his first Grand Prix of 1991 to maintain his record of winning Grand Prix. And look at Alesi! Alesi now pushing Ayrton Senna for that third position. They are on the last lap. Mansell coming home, he's coming down to the last corner now. He really can roll round and win in France now. And Nigel Mansell wins the French Grand Prix at the Nevers circuit and Manicourt waves victoriously out of his cockpit as Alain Prost goes through to finish exactly five seconds behind the Williams Renault and Renault have won in France and they and France will be delighted about that and Senna is coming home in third position if he can keep clear of Alesi I have no doubt that he will be able to because they're down to the last corner now and Senna is going to get those four points that he has been driving consistently for all through this 72 lap French Grand Prix by taking third place as he has. So, victory in France for Mansell. Prost in second position, Senna third in the McLaren. The second Ferrari of Jean Alesi finishes in fourth place ahead of Riccardo Patrese, one lap down in fifth place, and Andrea de Cesare sixth in the Jordan. I'm uh, still recovering. I'm in a little bit of shock. It might sound silly after all these years in Formula One, but to get past 16 for an Englishman is, is history and I've made history for myself and my country. Uh, Alan had a fantastic start. Unfortunately, I had a good start, which was ironic because the racing line was on the right, but we, he made a fantastic start and I followed him. And, and then it was just a question of trying to keep going. He, Alan was going very quick at the beginning and, uh, and then I managed to get past and then he passed me in the pits again. So, Nigel Mansell wins the French Grand Prix from Alain Prost, with Ayrton Senna third, ahead of Jean Alesi, Riccardo Patrese and Andrea de Cesaris. Ayrton Senna leads the World Championship now by 25 points from Nigel Mansell, with Riccardo Patrese third ahead of Alain Prost, Nelson Piquet fifth and Gerhard Berger in sixth position. Williams now only 13 points behind McLaren in the Constructors' Championship, ahead of Ferrari, Benetton fourth, and Tyrrell and Jordan in fifth and sixth places. Well, next weekend, the big one for Britain, the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. You can see the qualifying on Saturday, and of course, the whole race live on BBC.